bread from heaven. And we see John in Revelation 10 agreeing to take that manna and eat it, whereas Judah, Judas refused to eat it. We want to be those that are represented by John, and if we're not walking in that path, we understand that to the very last moment you're willing to turn us around. We ask that you do that. We ask that you would forgive us our sins this morning, that we might be prepared to receive whatever you have for us. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you open your word to our understanding, pour your latter rain out upon our understanding, that you take control of the message that I'm going to share, that you would touch it from a coal, with a coal from off your altar and purify it, purify my lips. Let me be hid behind your cross and let this message be for your glory and honor and used by your Holy Spirit to edify your people. We also ask a blessing upon the work we're doing with the DVDs and the live streaming. And we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for a good night's rest. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, by, for those of us that are involved with this recording, this morning worship series, I would think that the last three, which would be 21, 22, and 23, could be a section of its own, um, perhaps called the mystery of iniquity, in order to keep them broken up into packages where they're, dis they're easier to distribute. First five would be the spirit of prophecy, and then six through 20 would be the reform lines, 21 through 23, the mystery of iniquity. And now we're going to take up a section on the fall of Babylon. What's the first five? Pardon me? What's the first five? Spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy. Um, we're going to look at, you know, often on a regular basis, people will email or, or in, in, in some fashion connect with us and ask, about what we understand about a triple application of prophecy. What's a triple application of prophecy? And we've said it, and we've said this, what I'm going to say before, for a long time now. One of the representations of the third angel's message, one way that you can express it is Babylon has fallen, has fallen. I mean, you can say it's the third message, you can say it's the loud cry of the third angel's message, you can say it's the fourth angel's message, it's the latter rain. There's a lot of ways to represent this message with words, with terms, expressions. But one of them is Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Revelation 18, 2. Um, Revelation 14. And in the very expression, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, you see a triple application of prophecy. Because your responsibility at the end of the world is to announce to the world that Babylon has fallen, and the technique that you're to use to demonstrate that is that Babylon fell in the time of Nimrod, Babylon has fallen, and it fell in the time of Belshazzar, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And upon those two witnesses, because upon the testimony of two, a thing is established, upon Nimrod and Belshazzar, you will define the fall of modern Babylon at the end of the world. So in the very expression, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the significance of a triple application of prophecy is identified. And what we're going to look at now is today the, the fall of Nimrod. We're going to look at the characteristics of what brought the fall of Nimrod. And then we're going to go in and look at the characteristics of the fall of Nebuchadnezzar and the characteristics of the fall of Belshazzar. And we're going to do this in order to understand that Nebuchadnezzar is representing the Millerites and Belshazzar is representing Seventh-day Adventists. Black and white. From a lot of different directions. And Belshazzar represents Adventism at the end of the world that refuses to be warned by their foundational message. And that's what Daniel says when he comes into Belshazzar in chapter 5. He says, Thou though knewest all this, and he referred to him to the history of Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar was turned out like a beast for 2,520 days. That was Belshazzar's warning message from the book of Daniel that he rejected and lost his salvation because of. 
So we're going to show as we proceed that Nebuchadnezzar represents Millerite Adventism. And Millerite Adventism, Nebuchadnezzar, he's a saved man, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Belshazzar, he's a lost man. He's representing the Judases and Adventism at the end of the world. And if you've ever thought about it from yesterday's presentation, Judas' rebellion is manifested at the feast at Simon's house. You know, he's, he begins to fight against the Lord when Jesus gives the message of the bread of heaven. He refused to understand that he understood it. Sister White said he understood that Jesus was talking about spiritual flesh and spiritual blood. But it didn't fit with his plan for Jesus. He wasn't looking for a spiritual kingdom. He was looking for a literal kingdom. So he, he understood it, but he, even though he understood it, he rejected it. And then immediately thereafter, the histories that put in place are the feast at Simon's house, because Judas's rebellion is marked with the beginning of the feast, and then it's, his rebellion is finalized at a feast, the Last Supper. And if you've ever thought about it, technically the Last Supper is talking about Judas. The other 11 disciples, they ate suppers after then, and then when they're resurrected and go to the earth made new, they're going to eat suppers again, and Jesus is going to eat suppers again. The only one in the group that it was really the Last Supper for was Judas, right? It was his Last Supper that very night. And Jesus is going to eat again. Okay, so this Last Supper, that's Belshazzar having his Last Supper. Okay? But we already seen that Judas's Last Supper is Adventism's Last Supper, so you can see the connection just at the surface, just as you think it through, between Belshazzar and Adventism at the end of the world. And Nebuchadnezzar is, and we're going to show this. <laughs> this is in the notes, but it's just, it's a, uh, uh, for me at least, it's a gem, and I just, I really like it. So I'm going to have to put it in here, but we're going to show it to you later. Is there, any, is there any chapter in Ellen White that is inspired that she didn't write? Miller, William Miller's dream. Okay, we're going to show you that Nebuchadnezzar's William Miller. William Miller's dream that's in early writings was his second dream, by the way. The newsletter that we're sending out, hopefully this week, has both of Miller's dream, and it was his second dream that's in early writings. So we're going to, when we get to chapter 4 of Daniel, and that's where we're heading, we're also going to show that chapter 1 of Daniel is the first angel's message, 1798. Chapter 2 of Daniel is the second angel's message, 1842. And chapter 3 of Daniel is the third angel's message, 1844, in the Millerite history. But it's also a three-step process at the end of the world. But in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to show you, that's William Miller's dream. That's Millerite Adventism that gets scattered as the foundational truths get covered up. And chapter 5, Belshazzar, that's Judas in the Last Supper. That's Belshazzar in the Last Supper, rejecting the warning message of William Miller's dream in chapter 4. And what's chapter 6? <laughs> That's the crisis of the Sunday law when you get thrown in the, the den with the lions. Okay. By the way, is there, is there any chapter in Daniel that he didn't write? Daniel, four. Daniel chapter 4. That's Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Ah, that's Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, representing Miller's second dream. So that's some of the, the places we're going to go. It's going to take a little bit of time. But why are we doing it? Because we're looking at these tables as typified in prophecy, and you cannot separate William Miller's dreams from the truth about these tables. And William Miller's dream is marked in Daniel chapter 4. Okay, but there's other things that you need to see about the fall of Babylon if you're going to understand what the fall of Babylon is, and that's where we have to begin, unfortunately. Okay, in your notes. Bible Echo, September 17, 1894. In the history of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, God speaks to the people of today. 
The condemnation that will fall upon the inhabitants of the earth in this day will be because of their rejection of light. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we've lived in error, but from the fact that we have neglected heaven-sent opportunities for discovering truth. The means of becoming conversant with the truth are within the reach of all, but like the indulgent, selfish king, we give more attention to things that charm the ear and please the eye and gratify the palate than to the things that enrich the mind, the divine treasures of truth. It is through the truth that we may answer the great question, what must I do to be saved? So we're going to go back to, to the time of Nimrod now and look at the dynamics of the fall of Nimrod. Because Nimrod is the first mention. Nimrod. It's not Nimrod, huh? Okay. Nimrod is Nimron. Oh, it's one of those days, huh? Nimrod is the first mention of Babylon in the scriptures, and there's a definite fall of Babylon in there, so we're going to go through that. Um, notice that there is a covenant established to start off with in the story of Nimrod that Nimrod and his followers are going to reject. Genesis 8, and this is in your notes, in your handout, Genesis 8, verses 20 through 22. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl. When did he build this altar? Right after the flood. Why? Why? It, beginning a new dispensation. Where did God's people worship before the flood? Gar at the gates of the Garden of Eden. As soon as he gets off the, the ark... There's a new dispensation for worship, and it's the altar worship, because the Garden of Eden's been removed. Okay. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a, a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of the heart is evil from... For the imagination of man's heart is evil from... His youth, what's that about? What's that tell you? Mystery of iniquity. When the mystery of iniquity is marked in the scriptures, their imagination is the, the symbol of the fact that the mystery of iniquity has conquered the human being. Remember that. That's from the, the past. If you forgot that already... Just three days ago, then you need to go back and look. Okay, that's, we established that one. For this reason, we wanted, to, wanted us to see that the imagination is the symbol of when Satan gets control of you. He gets control of you, and the symbol that you are under the control of Satan is that you have an evil imagination. Okay. Neither, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I've done, while the earth remain a sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Okay, he's not going to destroy the earth with water anymore, and you can always count on the four seasons. Genesis 11, verses 1 and 2. So there's a covenant back here. After the flood, there's a covenant established. Because this is about breaking the covenant among other things. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Where are they coming from? Mount Ararat. They come to the land of Shinar. What's the land of Shinar? Babylon. And the plains of Shinar is where uh, Nebuchadnezzar, there's plains of Dura, but Shinar is Babylon. Okay, broken covenant. Verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. Okay, they're going to build something now. Are they going to use stone? They're going to use brick. Notice Exodus twenty twenty five, 
If thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Deuteronomy 27, 5 and 6. And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build an altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. Okay, Sister White's clear. We're going to show you that the Tower of Babel is their altar. Okay, but they didn't use stones, did they? They used bricks. They used... They mix, what they do? They mixed holy and unholy, light and darkness. The bricks represent human power, human strength, human devising. And it is a rejection of the covenant because the covenant was established with Noah when he was building the altar out of stone. So this is a rejection of the covenant of Nimrod and his followers. Who's the altar? This is from Selected Messages, Book 3, page 300. If you're rejecting the true altar, if you're saying, I'm going to do an altar of brick when you've been told to do an altar of stone, what are you rejecting? You're rejecting the altar? Well, what is the altar? Those who are not connected with God are connected with the enemy of God. And while they may be honest in the advice they give, they themselves are blinded and deceived. Satan puts his suggestions into the minds and words into the mouth that are entirely contrary to the mind and will of God. Thus he works through men to allure us into false paths. Thus he works through them to allure us into false paths. He will mislead, entangle, and ruin us if he can. Anciently, it was a great sin for the people of God to give themselves away to the enemy and open before them either their perplexity or their prosperity. Under the ancient economy, it was a sin to offer sacrifice upon the wrong altar. It was a sin to offer incense kindled by the wrong fire. We are in dangering, danger of mingling the sacred and the common. What's the mingling of the sacred and common? That's the mystery of iniquity. We're in danger of the mystery of iniquity. The holy fire from God is to be used in our efforts. The true altar is what? Christ. Christ. The true fire is the Holy Spirit. So if we're putting up a counterfeit altar out of bricks instead of stone, what are we putting up? A counterfeit Christ. We're rejecting Christ. We've broken the covenant. And in this history, when they're doing this, the mystery of iniquity is working. Right? Do you see it based upon the prophetic symbols? Because it always works in advance. Okay, verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, that we be, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Okay, so they're going to make a city, a tower. They're going to have a name because they don't want to be scattered. This also is a rejection of the covenant. Why is it a rejection of the covenant? The part I'm emphasizing here is they didn't want to be scattered. What did God tell Noah when he got off the ark? Disperse. Scatter out. Repopulate the earth. But Nimrod, they didn't want to be scattered. They wanted to stay together and build a kingdom. Okay, so this is a rejection of God's counsel as well. But what's the tower? In the parable, the householder represented God, the vineyard, the Jewish nation, and the hedge, the divine law, which was their protection. The tower was the symbol of the temple. The tower is a church. So when they're building this church out of brick, they're building a false church, a false altar, a false Christ. Micah 4, 8 says, And thou, O tower of the flock. Who's the tower of the flock? That's Christ. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee it shall come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. The tower of the flock is Christ. The first dominion is the dominion that Adam and Eve had before sin. And it's going to be, the earth made, is going to be made new again. That dominion is going to be reestablished by Christ, the tower of the flock, and given to the daughter of Jerusalem. That's us, if we're faithful. 
Signs of the Times, November 4, 1908. All that was lost by the first Adam will be restored by the second. The prophet says, O tower of the flock, the stronghold, stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee it shall come, even the first dominion. So the tower is the church. Is Christ the church? Yes. He's, he's the foundation of the church. The church of what? The church of the firstborn. Okay, what's a city? Um, and you have several references in here from the book of Revelation. A city is a kingdom. Okay? A city is a kingdom. So when they're going to build a city and a tower, they're building a system of church and state. And they're going to make themselves a name. A character. Their character. What is the combination of church and state in the spirit of prophecy? What does she call it? The image of the beast. The image of the beast is defined as the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship in the spirit of prophecy over and over again. They were making the image of the beast. They were building a city, a state, a tower, a church. And so what was their character going to be? The image of the beast. That's the character. That's the name. And they did it in rebellion against God because they didn't want to be scattered like he told them to do. They wanted to stay in the city and form a confederacy. So rather than read these quotes on the city being a kingdom from Revelation, I'm just going to put it in the record for those of you that are watching. Revelation 11.8, France is a kingdom, it's the great city. Revelation 14.8, and 21 talk about modern Babylon being the great city. The kingdom of Babylon is a great city. And in Revelation 21.10, he says, He carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. This is God's kingdom coming down out of heaven from God. A kingdom is a city. Nimrod and his cohorts were bring, building a kingdom and a church. They were establishing an empire that was a combination of church and state. Are church and state supposed to be combined? No. Only in Christ. But are they supposed to be com combined? Wh when they are, wh what is it? It's, it's the image of the beast. What else is it? It's a symbol of the mystery of iniquity. Because the mystery of iniquity is often illustrated in the scriptures as the men of God marrying the pagan wives. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair. <clears throat> and they took them every one wives. So the image of the beast is the combination of church and state, but it's also the, the climax of the work of the mystery of iniquity. You need, to, you need to keep that in your head when you get to Revelation 18.3. Okay, the investigative judgment of the living. That's what we're going to see here in Nimrod's story. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of men build. Did the Lord come down? He come down right here. And what's he going to do? He's going to investigate the city. Investigate. I need to not talk while I'm writing or I'll have to respell stuff. He's going to investigate this situation. And when he's investigating it, are Nimrod and the men that are building the tower alive? Yes. Ah. This is a judgment that takes place when men are living. And it begins when Christ comes down. You see it? All right. There's going to be a divine pronouncement here. Notice verse 6 of Genesis 11. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What's that mean? They've been weighed in the balances. They've, the judgment has taken place. And he's realized that the mystery of iniquity has been fulfilled in them. They've How did she say it about Judas? He crossed the boundary line. Okay, so now the Lord has, has judged them and said their imagination is going to be evil continually just as it was before the flood. They're repeating the history of the flood. 
they've crossed the boundary line. You see that? That's investigative judgment. And sometimes in Adventism, when we're really hardcore Laodiceans, we don't make the distinction between the investigative judgment and the executive judgment. What's the investigative judgment? That's when the Lord's going through the record books in heaven, determining who's lost and who's saved, right? Yeah. What's the executive judgment? That's when he punishes the wicked. Okay, executive judgment, investigative judgment, two different things. And in the story of Nimrod, we're going to see executive judgment too. The punishment is going to be meted out. He's just come down, began the judgment of the living, and then he's determined that their imagination... is wicked, they've just fallen away. Okay, there's the falling away first. And now he's going to deliver executive judgment. Now, in the story of, just to try to bring another line of thought in here, if we were looking at this in Judas, how many times did he covenant to betray Christ? Three. One, two, three. And this three-step testing process, this is the three-step testing process of Christ in the wilderness. And Judas began with the feast, and Christ began with the feast, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The temptation of appetite was his first test. So this three-step process, it's throughout the scriptures. This is the courtyard, this is the holy place, this is the most holy place. And when you get to the third way mark, no matter where you look, in John 16, 8, it says the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When it comes to the third way mark, you're going to see judgment illustrated, whether it's the most holy place judgment, or the work of the Holy Spirit, or the judgment of the cross. This is the executive judgment against Nimrod. Right? See it? Okay. Verse 7 through 9. Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Who's going down? God. But us. This, this, is, this isn't just one God. It says, let us go down. Now, he's already come down here, right? He says, let's go look at the city and tower. But he's going to come down here. And here he's bringing at least two. Us. And he's doing it right here. What happens right here? Well, here we see a sprinkling. And here we see the full outpouring as it comes down. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. When, when the full, per, full outpouring came on the day of Pentecost, what did they do? They spake in other tongues, just the opposite. The languages weren't confounded there, because this was a holy illustration. But the parallel here in Nimrod is the reverse, and the languages are confounded when the full outpouring comes down, when us comes down. All right, you see that? Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Did the people that were gathered in Jerusalem on Pentecost understand the disciples' speech? Yes. So the Lord what? Scattered them. There's the executive judgment against Nimrod. We scattered. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, the, from thence upon the face of all the earth, so they left off to build the city. Therefore the name is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound their, the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So in Nimrod, what I want you to see is this, and we're gonna, I'm going to say some things here, and then we'll read it to prove it. They broke the covenant, but the mystery of iniquity was already working, but they had a warning message. All right, we're going to read that. They had a warning message. Who was given that warning message? Primarily, primarily, Shem. 
I know it was there too, but Shem. Okay. Who executed Nimrod? Eh, the Bible don't say, Spirit of Prophecy don't say, but history says it was Shem. Okay, here the warning message is empowered, but it's also getting, after it's empowered, it gets rejected. Right? And then there's a divine pronouncement. What's the divine pronouncement? Their imagination. Pronounce. Is there an E? Mm -hmm. right, let's leave it there. Pr a divine pronouncement. Okay, th this is Millerite history, isn't it? It's the warning message of the first angel that's empowered on August 11th, 1840. And then it's rejected. And there's a divine pronouncement, Babylon has fallen. And then there's an executive judgment. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but back here, they've, they've fallen away. They're imagined. It's, Nimrod's the same as Millerite history. Right? Okay, let's read some stuff to try to put this into focus. This is from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 118 and onward. And this is... Oh, anyway. For a time the descendants of Noah continued to dwell among the mountains where the ark had rested. As their numbers increased, apostasy soon led to division. Those who desired to forget their creator and cast off the restraint of his law felt it a constant annoyance from the teaching and example... felt a constant annoyance from the teaching and example of their God-fearing associates, and after a time they decided to separate from the worshipers of God. Accordingly, they journeyed to the plain of Shinar on the banks of the river Euphrates. They were attracted by the beauty of the situation and the fertility of the soil, and upon this plain they determined to make their home. Sounds like a lot to me. Here they decided to build a city and an, in it a tower of such stupendous height as should render it would render it the wonder of the world. The enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth to replenish and subdue it, but the Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that, had eventually, that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heaven was to in intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the la latest generations. Fame to the latest generations. The dwellers on the plain of Shinar disbelieved God's covenant that he would not again bring a flood upon the earth. Many of them denied the existence of God and attributed the flood to the operation of natural causes. Others believed in a supreme being and, it, and that it was he who had destroyed the antediluvian world and their hearts, like that of Cain, rose up in rebellion against him. One object before them in the erection of the tower was to secure their own safety in case of another deluge. By carrying the structure to a much greater height than was reached by the waters of the flood, they thought to place themselves beyond all possibility of danger. And as they would be able to ascend to the regions of the clouds, they hoped to ascertain the cause of the flood. The whole undertaking was designed to exalt still further the pride of its projectors and to turn the minds of future generations away from God and lead them into idolatry. When the tower had been partially completed, a portion of it was occupied as dwelling places for the builders. Other apartments, splendid, splendidly furnished and adorned, were devoted to their idols. Oh, it's actually a church. The people rejoiced in their success and praised the gods of silver and gold. Isn't that what Belshazzar does? He praises the gods of silver and gold and set them against the ruler of heaven and earth. What's the gods of silver and gold? Ah, it's the thing that Judas really liked. Uh, okay. 
set themselves against the ruler of heaven and earth. Suddenly, the work that had been advancing so prosperously was checked. Angels were sent to bring to naught the purpose of the builders. What angels were sent? The first, second, and third angels' messages were sent to bring it to naught. If you can see that. Uh, where, does it, where was I? Okay, I was up on top. The tower had reached a lofty height, and it was impossible for the workmen at the top to communicate directly with those at the base. You ever played that little game? I think of something, I whisper it in her ear, and then she has to whisper it in her ear, and she has to whisper it in her ear, and, he, and her and him, and him to him, and him to her, and on through. And when you get to the end, what you're going to say, not almost always, is totally different than what I said, but we're all speaking the same language. So they got this system set up from this story to this story to this story to send down messages. It's going to be rough enough to make it work. But when suddenly this floor is speaking Spanish and this floor is speaking French and this is Greek down here, it all comes tumbling down. As messages were thus passing, uh, passing from one to another, the language was confounded so that the material was called for which was not needed and the directions delivered were, delivered were often the reverse of those that had been given, confusion and dismay followed. All work came to a standstill. There could be no further harmony or cooperation. The builders were wholly unable to account for the strange misunderstandings among them, and in their rage and disappointment, they reproached one another. Their confederacy ended in strife and bloodshed, Lightnings from heaven, as an evidence of God's displeasure, broke off the upper portion of the tower and cast it to the ground. Men were made to feel that there is a God who ruleth in the heavens. What did you see? 9-11. You see 9-11 in that, huh? That oh, okay. See 9-11. Lightnings from heaven <clears throat> taken down the tower. Okay, I, I, I'm just... Echoing a thought from the audience. Up to this time, all men had spoken the same language. Now those that could understand one another's speech, united in companies, some went one way and some another. The Lord scattered them abroad from the hence upon the face of the earth. This dispensation was the means of peopling the earth, and thus the Lord purposed. Purpose was accomplished through the very means that men had employed to prevent its fulfillment. But at what a loss to those who had set themselves against God. It was his purpose that as men should go forth to found nations in different parts of the earth, they should carry with them a knowledge of his will, that the light of truth might shine undimmed to surrounding succeeding generations. Noah, the faithful preacher of righteousness, lived for 350 years after the flood, Shem for 500 years, and thus their descendants had an opportunity to become acquainted with the requirements of God and the history of his dealings with their fathers, but they were unwilling to listen to these unpalatable truths. They had no desire to retain God in their knowledge. And what, what's the Bible say if you have no desire to retain God in your knowledge? You get a vain imagination. Okay, they, That's right here. But who's giving this message? Shem, Noah, the warning message. And by the confusion of tongues, they were, in a great measure, shut out from intercourse with those who might have given them light. Probation closes. The Babel builders had indulged in the spirit of murmuring against God. Instead of gratefully, gratefully remembering his mercy to Adam and his gracious covenant with Noah, they had complained of his severity in expelling the first pair from Eden and destroying the world by a flood. But while they murmured against God as arbitrary and severe, they were accepting the rule of the cruelest of tyrants. Isn't that the rule that Judas accepted? Satan was seeking to bring contempt upon the sacrificial offerings that prefigured the death of Christ. And as the minds of people were darkened by idolatry, he led them to counterfeit these offerings and sacrifices, their own children upon the altars of their gods. As men turned away from God, the divine attributes, justice, purity, and love were supplanted by oppression, violence, and brutality. The men of Babel had determined to establish a government that should be independent of God. 
There were some among them, however, who feared the Lord, but who had been deceived by the pretensions of the ungodly and drawn into their schemes. For the sake of these faithful ones, the Lord delayed his judgments and gave the people time to reveal their true character. Jesus knew about Judas right from the start, but he knew that if he rejected Judas, it would cast a stumbling block before his disciples and give the Pharisees and Sadducees ammunition to criticize him. So he delayed his judgments with Judas, just like he did here. It's the same history. As this was developed, the sons of God labored to turn them from their purpose. Come out of Babylon. Come away from Nimrod. As this was developed, the the sons of God labored to turn them from their purposes, but the people were fully united in their heaven-daring undertaking. What is this message here? Come out of Babylon. This This is where they're laboring. Come out. Judgment's coming. Had they gone unchecked, they would have demoralized. As this was developed, the sons of God labored to turn them from their purpose, but the people who were fully united in their heaven-daring undertaking, had they gone on unchecked, they would have demoralized the world in its infancy. Their confederacy was founded in rebellion, a kingdom established for what? Self-exaltation. Gadol in Daniel chapter 8. Gadol in Daniel chapter 8, symbolically represented by the daily in Daniel chapter 8 and 11 and 12, because the daily is the Hebrew word continual, and this self-exaltation, this kingdom of self-exaltation, it doesn't begin here, it began with the rebellion in heaven. It's the self-exaltation that is continually, from the beginning to the end, manifested in the rebels that follow Satan. The confederacy was founded in rebellion, a kingdom established for self-exaltation, but in which God was to have no rule or power or honor. Rule or honor. Had this confederacy been permitted, a mighty power would have borne sway to banish righteousness and with it peace, happiness, and security from the earth. For the divine statutes, which are holy, just, and good, men were endeavoring to substitute laws. What are they going to do? They're going to substitute their laws for God's laws. Men were endeavoring to substitute laws to suit the purposes of their own selfish and cruel hearts. What's that pointing forward to at the end of the world? Sunday law. law. Those that feared the Lord cried unto him to interpose, and the Lord came down to see the city which the children of men builded. In mercy to the world, he defeated the purposes, the purpose of the tower builders, and overthrew the memorial of their daring. In mercy, he confounded their speech, thus putting a check on on the purposes of rebellion. God bears long with the perversity of men, giving them ample opportunity for repentance, but he marks all the devices to resist the authority of his just and holy law. From time to time, the unseen hand that holds the scepter of government is stretched out to restrain iniquity. Did you get that? Iniquity is being restrained, but when the restrainer is removed, then the man of sin is going to be Manifested. Okay. Unmistakable evidence is given that the creator of the universe, the one infinite in wisdom and love and truth, is the supreme ruler of heaven and earth, and that none can with impunity defy his power. The scheme of the Babel builders ended in shame and defeat. The monument of their pride became the memorial of their folly. Yet men are continually pursuing the same course, depending upon self and rejecting God's law. It is the principle that Satan tried to carry out in heaven, the same that governed Cain in presenting his offering. There are tower builders in our time. Infidels construct their theories from the supposed deductions of sciences and reject the revealed word of God. They presume to pass sentence upon God's moral government. They despise his law and boast of sufficient boasts of the sufficiency of human reason. If you're going to understand the Bible correctly, some will tell you in Adventism that you have to, you have to be an expert on biblical history and biblical language. If you're not that, then go ahead and come and sit at my feet and I will teach you what the Bible means because 
my human reason has been fine-tuned in the schools that teach biblical history and biblical languages. Then, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the Son of Man is fully set in them to do evil. Did you get that? Sister White talks about this often. Then, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's the story of Judas, isn't it? Christ saw, knew about Judas from eternity past. But he had a purpose. He had a purpose to watch Judas make wrong decisions every day for three and a half years and not rebuke him until he got right down here at the end. He was a purpose for that. And the purpose for Judas was, as it would have, we've already commented, it would have put stumbling blocks for, before the disciples and put ammunition before, for the Pharisees and Sadducees to use. So could it be that, just as an example, that in 1863, when James White printed a counterfeit chart to counterfeit these two charts, that the Lord in His wisdom determined that in His mercy it would be to the benefit of more to not allow Ellen White to say anything about it one way or another. Does the Lord ever do something like that? Oh yeah. That's the wisdom of God. And to raise the argument that the 1863 chart is the chart because Ellen White never said anything saying it was wrong is to really misunderstand the character of Christ. And it's boasting that your sufficiency is based upon human wisdom. Okay, so what we have up here, you have in your notes, we have a broken covenant in the mystery of iniquities working right here, a warning message, Shem and Noah. The warning message is empowered when the Lord comes down. The investigation follows with the divine pronouncement. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. This is the falling away. And then the executive judgment is the scattering. And of course we have to emphasize this because we're going to see that this judgment in the time of Nimrod is the same judgment in the time of Nebuchadnezzar and it's the same judgment in the time of Belshazzar. Only with Nebuchadnezzar it's called seven times and with Belshazzar it's called 2520. But the seven times, the 2520 and the scattering, they're the same thing in the scriptures. So part of what we're doing here is showing the dynamics of the judgment of Babylon and we're trying to let everyone see that the dynamics of the judgment of Babylon is the same as the dynamics of the Lord working a revival and reformation among His people. Because God's dealings with men is ever the same. While God is putting this process in, the first angel's message comes into history, it's empowered when the mighty angel comes down. While He's working this history to produce 50 faithful souls to move into the most holy place with him in the Millerite history, this same history is accomplishing the story of Judas upon the class that is rejecting this identical history. So we want to see how the dynamics of this history is connected with the story of Babylon because we're going to be the ones, if we're faithful, that raise the cry, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And we need to understand what Babylon is if we're going to do that intelligently. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123. The schemes of the Babel builders entered in shame and defeat. The monument to their pride became their memorial of their folly. Yet men are continually pursuing the same court, depending on self and rejecting God's law. And it is the principle that Satan tried to carry out in heaven, the same that governed came in presenting his offering. There are tower builders in our time. Infidels construct their theories from supposed deductions of science 
and reject the revealed word of God. They presume to pass sentence on God's moral government. They despise his law, boast of sufficiency of human reasoning. Then because sentence against an evil work is not executed spe speedily, therefore the hearts of men are fully set in them to do evil. Now you can see that I left two paragraphs in there twice, okay, but moving on. In the professedly Christian world, Many turn away from the plain teachings of the Bible and build up a human creed from human speculations and pleasing fables, and they point to the tower, their tower as a way to climb up to heaven. Well, human creeds is a tower to heaven. Men hang with admiration upon the lips of eloquence, while hang with admiration upon the lips of eloquence, while it teaches that the transgressor, transgressor shall not die that salvation may be secured without obedience to God's law. If the professed followers of Christ would accept God's standard, it would bring them into unity. But so long as human wisdom is exalted above his holy word. So what is she saying here? To exalt human wisdom above God's holy word is what? It's to build the tower. It's Gadol. It's the kingdom of self-exaltation. So long as human wisdom is exalted above his holy word, there will be divisions and dissensions. The existing confusion of conflicting creeds and sect is fitly represented by the term Babylon, which prophecy applies to the world-loving chur churches of the last days. But, but she's just talking about Protestant churches here. Yeah. The Seventh-day Adventist church isn't a world-loving church, is it? No, she's not talking about the Advent. I mean, is she? Many seek to make a heaven for themselves by obtaining riches and power. Some of you may think I just called the Adventist Church Babylon. Brothers and sisters, I didn't just call the Adventist Church Babylon. The Adventist Church is Laodicea. Revelation Babylon is one kingdom. Laodicea is another kingdom. But Laodicea has people that have the character, lifestyle, and mentality of Babylonians. Can't deny it. You can die. You can die. Most of them do deny it at their own peril. Okay. To call Laodicea Babylon is to give it a compliment. Babylon is a sinister kingdom. All the blood of, of the faithful is on Babylon's garments. But the church, the nation, the people that have rejected more light than any other people in history is Laodicea. And that's what Sister White says we're judged by, is light. So the judgment against Laodicea will be a greater darkness than the judgment against Babylon. Many seek to make a heaven for themselves by obtaining riches and power. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, trampling upon human rights and disregarding divine authority. The proud may be for a time in great power and may see success in all they undertake, but in the end they will find only disappointment and wretchedness. The time of God's investigation is at hand. The Most High will come down to see that which the children of men have built. The sovereign power will be revealed. The works of human pride will be laid low. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon the inhabitants of the earth. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. The Lord will come down. This history is going to be repeated in our history. And she's talking about the history of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Review and Herald. Satan has taken the world captive, March 8, 1898. He has introduced an idle Sabbath, an idle Sabbath. How does, how's that spelled in your notes? I-D-O-L. It's not I-D-L-E, the Sabbath where you sit around and do nothing, you're idle. He's introduced a counterfeit Sabbath, Sunday, the symbol of an idol. It's the idle Sabbath. Satan has taken the world captive. He has introduced an idle Sabbath, apparently giving to it great importance. He has stolen the homage of the Christian world away from the Sabbath of the Lord for this idle Sabbath. The world bows to the tradition, a man 
to a tradition, a man-made commandment. As Nebuchadnezzar set up his golden image on the plain of Dura, and so exalted himself, so Satan exalts himself in this false Sabbath, for which he has stolen the livery of heaven. So, the tower there was a false Sabbath. It was the idol. It was the idol church. The Sabbath is God's memorial to his creative work, and it is a sign that it is to be kept, that is to be kept before the world. There is to be no compromise with those who are worshiping the idol Sabbath. The tower is a symbol of Sunday. Crest Collection, page one. This is our final reading. This confederacy was born of rebellion against God. The dwellers on the plains of Shinar established their kingdom for self-exaltation and not for the glory of God. Had they succeeded, a mighty power would have borne sway, banishing righteousness and inaugurating a new religion. The mixture. What's the mixture? Yeah, the, what's the word that she used that we... Amalgamation. amalgamation. Amalgamation is mixture. The mixture of certain religious ideas with a mass of erroneous theories, the mystery of iniquity, would, re, would have resulted in closing the door of peace, happiness, and security, if Nimrod was allowed to carry on with his religion. These suppositions, erroneous theories carried out and perfected would have banished a knowledge of the law of Jehovah from the minds of men who would not think it necessary to obey the divine statutes. These statutes, which are holy, just, and good, would have been ignored. Determined men, inspired by the first great rebel, would have urged, would have urged on by him and would have permitted nothing to interfere with their plans or to stop them in their evil course. In the place of the divine precepts, they would have substituted laws framed in accordance with the desires of the selfish heart in order that they might carry out his purposes. This is prefiguring the Sunday law at the end of the world. But God never leaves the world without witnesses for him. There's Shem. There's Noah. Those who loved and feared him at the time of the first great apostasy after the flood humbled themselves and cried unto, God, unto him, O God, they pleaded, interpose thyself between thy cause and thy plans and methods of men. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, the great idol building. Mm. It's the idol Sabbath. Which the children of Ben builded. And that's her words, not mine. He defeated the purposes of the tower builders and overthrew the memorial of their rebellion. What's the Sabbath? It's the memorial of creation. But the tower was the idol building. It was the memorial of rebellion. God bears long with the perversity of men, giving them ample opportunities for repentance, but he marks all their devices to resist the authority of his just and holy law. As an evidence of his displeasure over the building of the tower, he confounded the language of the builders so that none could understand the words of his fellow workers. The Lord has not ordered some of the arrangements that have been made at Battle Creek. He has declared that other places have been robbed of the light and advantages that have been centered and multiplied in Battle Creek. Through a circular letter sent out to the leading men and the church elders of our conferences, a call has been made for the names of young men and young women of capability in order that they may be corresponded with and invited to come to Battle Creek to receive a training for missionary work. Through the light given in the testimonies, the Lord has indicated that He did not desire students to be educated in Battle Creek. He instructed us to remove the college from this place. This was done, but the institutions that remained failed of doing what they should have done in sharing with other places the advantages centered in Battle Creek. The Lord signified his displeasure over this matter by destroying two of the principal institutions remaining there. Notwithstanding the plain evidences of the Lord's providence in these destructive fires, men in council meetings have not hesitated to stand before the brethren and make light of the statement that these buildings were burned because men had been swaying things in the direction the Lord could not approve. She just compared the work of Battle Creek 
with the work of Nimrod's tower. She also told us, don't let our children get educated there. Why? Because that's where the mystery of iniquity doth work. And that's where the vain imagination will be established in the hearts of our children. Okay, so what we're saying here is that there is a, a structure to the judgment process of Babylon. We took some time to look at it, but one of the things I did not emphasize a, very much of, but I'm going to at least put it in your memory banks, is when it comes to the divine pronouncement and the executive judgment, what represents that divine pronouncement and the executive judgment in the story of Nimrod is the scattering. Okay, because brothers and sisters, we're going to show you that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and that Nebuchadnezzar represents Millerite Adventism, and in Millerite Adventism there was a warning message given to Nebuchadnezzar, which was the seven times. And at the end of Adventism, represented by Belshazzar, his warning message was Nebuchadnezzar's warning message. Daniel said, Though thou knewest all these things, and his divine pronouncement and judgment wasn't the scattering, it wasn't the seven times, it was many, many tekel your farsin, which adds up to 2520. So in all three Babylons, the divine pronouncement and judgment is the 2520. And at the beginning of Adventism with Nebuchadnezzar, we see the seven times. And at the end of Adventism, we see the seven times message rejected by the leadership of Adventism. And we're going to suggest that these charts represent the argument over the 2520 that has been prefigured by Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, and Belshazzar. And these charts have been typified repeatedly in the scriptures. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do not want to be a tower builder in our own personal experience or in our church family. We ask that you come down to each of us individually and investigate what our life is building, pointed out to us what needs to be changed, what needs to be taken away through the fire that comes down out of heaven and knocks the top of the building off. Make those changes in our life with our cooperation that we can be John and not Judas. We see that probation is fast closing for us. We have a work to do individually and a work to do among your church. So we ask that you would help us to get prepared correctly to accomplish that work. We ask a blessing upon the work we're doing here with the DVDs and the live streaming. And we step before you this day of service that each of us have and ask that it would be a safe day and a productive day and one that would glorify and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.